How many of you remember those sort of old school computer games where you have kind of level one and you do that and then you have a boss at the end of it which you fight and you beat and then you go to level two and then you go through that and you have another boss at the end of that and then you keep going and then at the end of the game there's this big boss and to complete the game you have to defeat him because it's usually him and usually you think you try it a few times and maybe you defeat him but sometimes you think this is just too difficult I just can't be bothered I've basically completed the game all I've got to do is this big boss at the end and then I can say I've done it but you know there are other games to play I'm gonna go and do something else that is exactly what it's like learning a new language you start off on level one and you learn how to say hello my name is how are you etc and you complete that and you go to level two and you learn how to order coffee and ask for directions to the train station and then you can start talking about what you do at your weekend and then you can talk about feelings and then technical subjects and at the end is the big boss and that is pronunciation <laughs> And the reason it's the big boss is because so many people think I've basically completed the game. All I've got to do is complete, defeat this big boss and then I can do it. But you know what? Everyone can understand me. I can understand everyone else. I've just written a PhD in particle physics in English. Why do I care about pronunciation? The reason you should care about pronunciation is because it's the first impression you give to someone you're speaking with. It doesn't matter if you've just written your PhD in particle physics. Before you ever get to discussing your PhD in particle physics and how incredibly intelligent you are, people listen to how you are saying things a long way before they listen to what you're saying. So at Toastmasters, we spend a lot of time trying to get rid of all these little bits and pieces that hinder our audience from understanding us and accepting what we have to say. So we look at the R, we have the R counter who takes away all the R's and the ands, which I've done several of already, and the so's, and then we have the uh, ev evaluators who look for people who are saying things too quietly. Today we are going to look at pronunciation because people shouldn't have to decipher what you're trying to say because it's a hindrance from them getting uh, to know you. Imagine if you go to a job interview and you're wearing a pair of jeans and a ripped t-shirt. It doesn't matter how qualified you are, people will see it straight as you come through the door and they'll be like, uh -huh. don't let pronunciation do that to your English. Okay. Now, it is a huge topic, and when I say a huge topic, I mean there are people who spend their entire lives looking at just a tiny little bit of it. So we're not going to learn all of it in an hour. But what we will be able to do is learn the basic, or not learn, or discover the basic concepts of pronunciation and phonetics. And also you'll learn the terminology around it. Because anyone who is at the Wednesday's Toastmasters uh, and heard Martha's speech, she said that she, she didn't know what to do with her life and she was lying there staring at the ceiling and when she tried to Google, you know, staring at the ceiling, it wasn't very helpful. But when she learnt the term existential anxiety, then she had something that she could look up. So at the end of this session, you will have a lot of things that you can look up and you'll know roughly what they are, at the least. So you can then go away and think, okay, this is what I really need to look at and now I know where to look. So what is pronunciation? Why do people sound differently? I mean, we all have mouths, everyone, yeah? We all have mouths, and we're all speaking English. So why do even native, two different native speakers sound so different when they speak? Who here can play an instrument? Oh, quite a lot, that's good. When you've learned to play an instrument, imagine it's a cello, okay? You've got the strings and you've got the bow. And you put your fingers in a particular uh, formation and you draw the bow in a particular way and a B-flat comes out. And then you change your the position of your fingers again, you draw the bow and a G comes out. It is exactly the same principle with pronunciation. 
You arrange your mouth in a particular way and you expel air and a certain sound comes out. Now, violins and cellos, they're all made to the same size so that when anyone who picks them up, well almost anyone, you know, like anyone who knows how to play picks them up, uh, can, can produce an A or a G or a B flat by using the same, uh, the same uh, formation of fingers. And we all have different sized mouths and different sized tongues and, you know, we're all different shapes and sizes. So there's going to be some natural variation in how we sound. But why do we all sound completely differently when we speak English? The reason is because when we approach lang a new language, we're very, we very often are like a cello player who then tries to learn the violin. And they take everything they've learnt from playing the cello and think, I can pretty much do the same on the violin. I mean, there's strings, there's a bow, I can just, you know, I just play it like this. And you'll get a sound, and maybe it'll be okay, but you're not going to sound like someone who's learnt the violin from the beginning. So what you have to do is you have to forget everything you know about your native languages. Not literally everything, I mean, you want to, you want to be able to talk to your friends and family, but <clears throat> you need to forget all the sounds that you can make. And you need to think, how do I make sounds in my native language? How do I make sounds when I speak English? And how does a native English speaker make sounds when they speak it? What formation of their mouth and all the bits uh, that go around it do they use? Because if you recreate those, you will sound exactly like a native speaker. You might not sound exactly like me, but you will sound like it's the native speaker you would have been if you had grown up in, in Britain or, or the USA. So, and the way to do it is like learning an instrument or playing football or learning ballet. You, no one dances Giselle from their first lesson or no one you know, plays a football match from the first lesson if you were going to do it properly or tries to play Greek's piano concerto. You take little bits and you repeat them over and over and over again. So that when you put them together, you don't have to think. Because at the moment, I'm not thinking about when I'm speaking. And none of, none of us do. You know, we don't think, okay, my lips have to do this, and my tongue should be doing this, and my vocal cords should be doing this. We just, we just use them. We just create sound. And that is great when you're speaking your native language, and it is a massive trap when you're speaking another language, because you do everything on autopilot. And you sound not like a native speaker. So what we're going to look at first is what is this instrument? Because it is a lot more complicated, I think, it's a lot, you think that it's probably a lot simpler than it is because I did when I started learning this and I was like, well it's the tongue and the lips and that's kind of, I mean what else? It's not, I assure you. <clears throat> this is a cross section of, of someone's face, okay? So here you have the nose, this is the nostril, and this is the mouth going down into the stomach and going down into the lungs. And the first part of the system is fairly obvious. It's the lips here. They round or they close to create sound. The next part of the system is slightly less obvious, but it's very, very important. And it's the teeth. Now you can't use your teeth to make a sound, but you use them to create, use them in concert with other parts of your mouth to create very important sounds. And it's the same with this next bit. If you put your tongue on the front of your teeth, I can't do this and talk at the same time, so I'll, I'll try. <laughs> but okay, put your tongue on the front of your teeth, like this, and then move the tongue down the back of your teeth, and you'll get to a sort of, you'll get to like a gum like a bit of the mouth, quite, kind of quite hard, okay? That's the next bit. It's called the alveolar ridge, and you probably didn't even know it existed, you probably just thought, this is my mouth, but it's called the al alveolar ridge, and it is very, very important in, in differentiating between certain kinds of sounds that we'll go into later. If you go from the alveolar ridge with your tongue, it'll kind of go like that, and then there'll be this sort of like, cliff drop, and then you'll go to the roof of your mouth, okay, so the hard roof of your mouth. That's called the hard palate. And if you keep going back with your tongue, 
don't make yourself sick, but keep going back with your tongue. You can feel it become slightly soft in the back, uh, just where your throat is. And that's called the soft palate. And the correct name for it is the velum. And the reason it's important to know the correct name for it is because the correct name is used as an adjective later when describing certain kinds of consonants. I, w- I would just like to say, um, by all means, obviously make notes, uh, but if anybody wants this presentation, I will email it out to people. If you just let me, send, send me an email at the end, uh, and uh, you, can, you can have this presentation. So you don't have to like draw this, uh, <laughs> like you can focus on it. <coughs> okay, the next very important part is not a part of the mouth at all. It's the nasal cavity up here. And it's, you, what you do is you sort of bounce sounds through it. So you're, mm, that sort of nasal sound. Again, you can't actually use it to create a sound itself, but you can use it, you can bounce other sounds through it to give it a nasal quality. The next bit is the tongue. This is what most people think of when creating sound. But the tongue is like the bow of a cello or a violin. If you wave it in the air, you will get nothing whatsoever. But you need everything else of the instrument to be able to create a sound. So if you just wave your tongue around, I say, you'll get nothing. Like, uh. <laughs> okay. But if you put it against your teeth and blow out, then you can create some sort of sound. The next bit is called the epiglottis. And this is here. It's a flap of skin that goes over the windpipe. So here you have what's called the esophagus, which is where food goes down. And here you have what's called the trachea. And to make sure that when you eat something or drink something, uh, it doesn't go into your lungs, you have a little flap of skin over, over the tube. And it's called the epiglottis. And you use it to create certain sounds. There's only one sound in... Uh, the English I speak that is used by the epiglottis, and we'll go through it later, but there are others in your languages and in certain other dialects of English. And uh, again, <clears throat> the reason we're learning these slightly more complex terms is because they're used late. It's the terminology is really important if you want to go away and look this up yourself, because looking at flap of skin is not going to get you anywhere. And the final part is uh, the vocal cords, which are here, and you can use them uh, to vibrate. And we'll go more into that later, because a lot of sounds in English, and in fact all languages, the only difference between them is whether you vibrate your vocal cords or not. Everything else is exactly the same. This whole, all of these things together, is called the articulatory system. If you know the verb to articulate, to speak or to uh, pronounce. So if you want to learn more, <coughs> Google the articulatory system. But these are the really important, the really important bits of the articulatory system. <coughs> so now we know how the instrument works, but what notes can we play on it? What sounds can we create? And this is entirely dependent on what kind of dialect or what kind of language you wish to speak. Now, I'm not here to tell you what the best dialect is. It's mine. (laughs) But, But I will say this. Dialects bring with them a... with connotations and preconceptions. Okay? Think back to your home countries, okay? There is going to be an area or a town that you just think, when you listen to people from it, you just think, either you, I just can't bear to listen to you, you just like, that <laughs> sound, or they sound really stupid, or, you know, it, everywhere, everywhere has it, and English is no different. So, be careful when you pick, but that's not to say that sort of posh English is better. You know, I was talking about the going to a job interview in a uh, ripped t-shirt and jeans. Well, maybe that actually works if you're going at some hip design company. Maybe you don't want to turn up in a suit. Maybe uh, jeans and a t-shirt is what, is what you need. So, just be aware of what are you going to use your English for, or any language. I'm going to be talking about English, obviously, but this is relevant to any language. And more important, or as important, as which dialect you pick is consistency. Pick one and stick with it. 
don't pronounce some words with British English and some with American English and some with Australian English because there is nothing more distracting than listening to someone uh, give a speech and thinking where are they from uh, because you just like okay they're saying it like this oh, what? Mm. Um, so be consistent Pick it up. but I'm going to be talking about the kind of English I speak which is called received pronunciation in, in, in uh, the correct terms so there is a group of sounds that make up received pronunciation and they are these sounds. I'm going to ask, how many people have seen a chart like this before? Okay, quite, okay, there's some sort of yeses and some sort of sort ofs. Uh, right, this is called a phonemic chart. Every language has one, there's some overlap between them and even in between uh, English dialects, you'll, uh, the uh, Scottish uh, phonemic chart would be different to this. This is the phonemic chart for the English that I'm, I'm speaking now. And the correct, I've been, at the moment I've been saying sounds, what sounds can you make? But the correct term is actually phoneme when you're talking about the sounds we, we speak. So I'm going to try and use that from now on. So these, each, uh, character here represents a phoneme. And you can see it's divided into two main groups, the grey group and the yellow group. And the grey group is divided into two blocks. So we'll take the first main group. And these are vowels. Now a vowel is any kind, is any phoneme where there is no resistance through in the airway. So, if we take the first one, it's E. Sorry, the, the first subgroup are called monophthongs, and these are simple vowels. So they are single individual vowel sounds. So the first one is E, as in sheep. And by all means, like you can do the sounds whilst I'm doing them. If you if you want to sort of get a feeling, you know, this is. Uh, I mean, we're filming this, and it's going to go up on YouTube. But apart from that, don't be self-conscious. Um, so. You say e, e. There's no resistance anywhere. Your lips are parted. Your tongue is not in the way. Your epiglottis isn't creating any friction or any kind of stop. So this is what characterizes a vowel. So we have e. The next one is i, as in ship. I. The next one is u, as in Good. Good. The next one is oo, as in shoot. The next one is or, as in door. Door. It's not or, it's or. Or. It's very, the, the or is a different phoneme. So if you find yourself going sort of like or at the end of it, it's, it's wrong. The next one is er, uh, as in bird. And, yes. and it is not to be confused with this next one. And the next one, it's called, the, the character is called a schwa. And it is the most common sound in the English language. It is vitally important to recognize the difference between these two. And I'll be going into this more at the end. But a schwa is pronounced uh. So uh, uh. uh. Yeah. <laughs> stressed, non stressed. Okay? So teacher. 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 Not teacher. teacher. Okay? <laughs> teacher. Okay. The next one is eh, as in bed. The one after that is a, as in cat. It's not air, but if anyone speaks Danish uh, or Norwegian, <coughs> it's not that. This next sound is what differentiates received pronunciation from other dialects. It's a. Uh. Up. Up. Ben, how would you say <laughs> that word? Up. Ben uses that sound to say the word. He says, up. Because that's what people in the north say. 
There's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> if you want to use received pronunciation, you will be revealed immediately as someone who doesn't know it if you say up. You have to say up or curry or hurry. Not up, curry, hurry. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll write it down for you at the end. Uh, the next one is R, as in far. Again, not R. R. Far. <laughs> and the last one is O, as in on. On. Now, maybe you're all thinking, how on earth am I going to remember all this? I'm, at the end, I'm going to give you a link to an interactive phoneme chart. And what you can do is you can click on this, and someone who is a native speaker with received pronunciation will say E and then sheep. So you'll be able to hear the sound and a word with the sound in. So you don't have to worry too much, just in, sort of enjoy it now and sort of <laughs> just get used to the idea that it's very important to differentiate between certain sounds. Don't worry too much if you can't remember everything at the moment. Okay. Now, monophthongs can be combined, so you can have simple vowel sounds and make them slightly more complex. And they are called diphthongs. And the first one is ia, as in here. Yeah. If you're saying here, it's wrong. It's a vowel, it's not an R sound at the end of it. I know it's spelt with an R, but it's here. 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 The next one is a. Wait. 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 Sounds good. These all sound very, very good. This next one is another classic for differentiating between received pronunciation and other dialects. It's ua, as in tourist. Ben, <laughs> how would you pronounce that word? Tourist. Oh, that's a, I was expecting a bit more of a tourist. Maybe from overside. Yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> Ben's failed me. Uh, okay, so a lot of, there are a lot of dialects of English that they use this instead. They say tourist. But if you wanted to speak received pronunciation, you should say tourist. So it's an ua. Ua. Okay. Can you say both again? Tourist. Tourist. Aurist. Okay. Good way of learning how to pronounce a word. Don't start at the beginning, start at the end. So everyone, ist, ist. ist. Orist. 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 Tourist. Tourist. Okay, ist, ist. ist. Orist. 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 Tourist. 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 Yeah. Does everyone hear this difference a bit more now? <laughs> or, <laughs> or, ua, or, ua. Or, ua, tourist, 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 tourist. We can go through it again at the end. The next one is oi, as in boy. That's quite an easy one to I say. The next one is o, as in show. Okay. <laughs> the next one is air, so that's like this one in Danish, but air, hair, hair, hair. So when you pronounce hair in uh, received pronunciation, there shouldn't be so much R at the end of it. It should be hair, hair, hair. Okay. The next one is I, as in my. Mm. And the next one is ow, as in cow. Cow. Lovely. Okay. Now, this is, as I say, you can get the how to you get the phoneme uh, chart so that you can click on. But a better way of looking at these, the monophthongs, which these are the ones you need to learn how to pronounce, because once you have got that, you can build these uh, by yourself. You can look at this. And it's called a vowel trapezium, <laughs> okay? And there are two axes on the vowel trapezium, okay? You have the top axis, 
Both of the axes are about the position of the tongue in the mouth when you're pronouncing the vowel. That's why it's useful to have, because then, whether it's at the front, the centre, or the back, and whether it's called close, mid, or open, but you can also think of it as top, mid, or bottom. So, if we take this, e, e, the tongue is at the front of the mouth and near the top of the mouth. There's not that much gap between the tongue and the top of the mouth. E, e. Take this, a, a, a. There's much more gap. You know, it goes. The tongue moves down in your mouth. A, a. Okay, a, a. Then we can go to the back, front and back. So we can take e and u, e, u, e, u. Alternate between them and just think, what is happening with my tongue in my mouth? Again, it's all on YouTube, don't worry. <laughs> e, u, e, u. And then you can have u and r, u and r. So the tongue is at the back of the mouth in both of them, but in u it's at the top and at r it's at the bottom. Okay? Again, you can find these, I'll, I'll email this out to everyone. It's not like, oh, and now I know the recipe for, for saying E correctly. But it's a guide, and it's a very useful guide. for th if, you, if you say E, and you, and you think, when you do it in, when you're speaking English, and you think, actually my tongue is more like mid, uh, in the middle of my mouth, or at the bottom of my mouth when I'm saying it, then you know something's not quite right, and you should be moving your tongue up to the top. Okay? So we call the vowel trapezium. Again, there's, there's only so many vowel sounds in the world, so that you can fit them all on this. Uh, and if you look on Wikipedia, you can see one with all of them. So you can see where the vowels in your language fit into the vowel trapezium, which is quite good, because then you can see, okay, is the sound that I make when I think I'm saying E, is it the same as in a received pronunciation, or whatever language you're going to be what saying? About when the middle is two? This is the e eh and the air. Eh. This is the because it's in the middle of the middle. So eh, uh, sorry, it's uh and uh. Sorry, it's uh and uh. So it's the same. It's the same sound. All you're doing is stressing it or not stressing it. But it's the same. That's the only difference between the the schwa. This uh and uh uh. Okay. So the stressing means longer, or what is in terms of the. It's how much uh, force you're placing on it. So in this case, uh, your uh and uh is how uh, it's, it's to do with the vocal cords and how much you're uh, sort of articulating the uh, the sound. So uh 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 uh. Oh. Try putting your put your fingers on your throat and say uh, uh. and now say uh. uh. Can you feel the difference? Yeah. Okay, so this is the this is the difference between the two the two sounds. But the rest everything else is actually the same. You're not moving your tongue in any other way. You're saying the tongue is in the middle uh, and in terms of back and forth and the middle up and down. Uh in received pronunciation anyway. Um, just to give you an air, <laughs> just to show you what it sounds like. I understand you might be thinking, look at this and think, oh, fuck, but like, it's, it's, and it's not, as I say, the idea is it's a guide, <coughs> so you can use it to think, okay, maybe I need to look at the vowels I'm, I'm saying. Uh, think of it more as a sort of diagnostic tool, rather than a, this is exactly how I, this is what I can use to pronounce it correctly. You can look, compare it to your own vowels. So now we have, we've looked at the vowels. And a vowel, we say, is a phoneme where there is no interference. So a consonant is where there is interference. By some other part of the articulatory system is interfering in the expulsion of air from the mouth. So this is a lot darker than I was expecting, but uh, I hope everyone can see. So we've just done this with our, with our uh, fingers against our throats. Here, we have a classic pair of phonemes where the only difference is one is voiced and one is unvoiced. And the first one is pronounced p as in p and b as in boat. 
And if you put your fingers on your throat again and say pa and ba pa ba you're doing exactly the same thing with your lips but you can you can feel pa 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 nothing ba 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 your vocal cords are vibrating sorry pa ba pa ba pa ba <laughs> but the, what, what is happening to the lips is the same. Because, yes. Because you're creating. We can go into the kind. I, I tell you what, we'll, we'll go into this in a second because I'm going to come to P and, uh, to P and B. We're going to look at. We're going to categorize all of these. Okay. <laughs> it's cool. It's no worries. But th th this is a really good case in point of where sort of like uh, first languages can maybe have slightly different sounds, and it's quite normal. And it probably doesn't make any difference if your lips are doing something slightly different, because uh, you're still the sound will be different. But we have an another pair here, and v. Okay. So your teeth. It's creating friction with your teeth. So and v. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and again, the only difference is whether. So, fly and video. Okay? And next we have M uh, or M and N, man and now. Now, N. And then we have T and D. T, D. So, if you say the word da, you can feel it against the alveolar, your tongue is against the alveolar region. Can yeah. you go back to M and N? Yeah. How you say it? Ma. 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 And N? N. No. Now. Now. But now. You like your zips and another one I don't? Ma. Ma. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, these aren't pairs. Sorry, these aren't necessarily, these, we're not, they're not all pairs. Sorry. Oh, I'm just going through two. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. No, these, I'm just going through two and two. Like, uh, so, yeah, no, they're not, uh, they're not pairs. I'll do them individually, until, unless they are pairs. Um, these are very similar, but if you say dog, you can feel the tongue against the alveolar ridge when you make it. Whereas teeth, t -t is using the teeth. It's like it's designed for it. Now we have another, we have another pair. This is th, and this is th. <laughs> Think. Think and this, 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 and think, 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 think. Okay. Again, this is something people do mix up quite a lot because this doesn't exist in all. This is some sounds you don't have in other languages. So, but. It's worth always thinking, okay, these are two very different sounds. If you say this, uh, or say think, then you're, it's, it's not right. Uh, needless to say. So, uh, tree, like an apple tree, which one is it? Tree, that's that. T tree. <laughs> T and then that. Tree. Tree. Three, as in the number, that's this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next, we have English's nasal sound, which is mm. Mm. So, sing. So, if you're saying sing, you're saying it incorrectly. Okay? You say singing, so the last one is mm, and the middle one is g, g, sing, ing. Okay? Singing. Okay? Singing. Singing. Where do you have the At the very end. So, uh, singing. Mm. Yeah, singing. <laughs> but it's obviously it's a bit more natural when you're singing. 
It's, it shouldn't be a stressed G at the end. It should be a nice nasal G, uh, because otherwise it's uh, uh, otherwise it sounds like you are stressing it. Because you could say my singing teacher uh, to differentiate from a different kind of teacher, but uh, you're um, but no. You, otherwise, generally, when you see ing at the end of a word, you should be saying mm. So singing is not correct. It's actually singing. Singing. There should be a G. Singing. It should be a G in the middle, and a G, and an N mm at the end. Is that in your particular dialect, or is it like common across many English? How do you say singing? Singing. 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 So you do nasal twice. Sing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> singing. Singing. Sometimes we don't even pronounce the G at the end. No. <laughs> singing. <laughs> yeah. Singing. Okay. <laughs> we can go through this again. But we can if if there are certain sounds that people are like what, then we've we've got time for some questions at the end that we can spend some more time looking at them. Next one, a fairly easy one. Huh. Hat. Okay. This next one is one that Swedish people get very badly wrong. Ch. And a lot of people say sh instead. They say cheeseburger. <laughs> and it's cheeseburger. Okay. So they say this. A lot of people say this, which is sh. But it's ch. Okay. The next one is j. Also a sound that lots of languages don't have. And it's not j. It's j. It's forceful in at the beginning. Okay? J. So, ch. J. Okay? Again, we'll do, we're going to come back to these in a, in a second. S. C. Yes. <laughs> Z. Zoo. Okay? Uh, s and z, yes. Unvoiced, voiced. S, z, s, z. Love and red. L and r. L, l, r. Okay? Can you repeat the R? R. Red. Red. So not too rolled, red. Not red. Uh, uh, but red. Red. No, I'm really, I'm really, I'm red. Red. Yeah. That's, it's nothing to be afraid of. Can you repeat the correct one? Red. Red. Yeah. You you should roll it less. Uh, if you're unsure, roll it less. I would. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's my top tip. Okay, um, I'm just trying to think if that's a dialect thing as well. The rolling. Rolling. Scottish. Scottish. Yeah. Kim. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Feel free. How do you say? Red. Red. I would say red. I would say red. Red. Yeah. Yeah. My uncle Ronnie. You say, you say red. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with this, but don't combine the two. Like, don't, don't say curry. Curry. <laughs> like, it'll be awful. Uh, okay, so now we have k and g. Again, similar, so voice, unvoiced in voice. K, g, k, g. Uh, and now we have, oh, so car and go. And now we have. Shall, sh, shall, and z. So television. Okay. So don't combine. Don't mix these two up. So television, 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 z, z. And then we have w, wet, and the j is not a j. It's a y. So yes. Yes. Now. The reason we learned all about the mouth uh, and what all those complicated names were is because 
a better way of arranging these is we said that the consonant's about friction, about some sort of interference. And you can arrange consonants based on where is the resistance? Where, where is it happening? Or what, what's involved? And what kind of resistance is it? So here we have labial, which means lips. Okay, so that means there's some sort of something is happening with the lips to create this block or resistance in the in the speech. Dental, that's teeth. Okay, so something is happening with the teeth if you if you're creating one of these. Alveolar, that's the alveolar ridge, a bit just behind the the back. Post alveolar, if you go to the with your tongue to the alveolar ridge, okay, you've got your teeth here, and then the alveolar ridge here. And then it kind of, there's this like cliff face, you know, that goes kind of up. And then you've got the roof of the mouth. That kind of cliff bit, that kind of really steep incline, that's called the post-alveolar region. So some sounds are created there. Okay? So it's sort of like on the, it's like on the ridge bit, the actual, like the actual ridge bit. Uh, I can go back and show you if it's unclear on the diagram. Palatal, that's the hard palate, the, you know, the hard bit of the roof of your mouth. Vela, that means the velum, the soft bit at the back of the roof of your mouth. And glottal, that means the epiglottis, the flap of skin that goes over your windpipe to stop drinking stuff going down. And then what kind of resistance? So nasal, that means it's something is happening with the nasal cavity as well. So you have mmm, you can see that you can, if you say mmm, you can feel it behind your nose. Uh, or um, a classic, of course. A stop. That means that the sound stops completely. So, if you think of if you think of a vowel like ah, uh, you can do it for as long as you have breath. You can't make a p sound any longer than you can make a p sound. So, p, p, p. Yeah, you can make lots of them, but you can't extend the p sound out. So. <laughs> Anything that's called a stop means that the sound starts, it goes to here, and it stops. Okay, so it's good to it's good to know. I'm going to jump over this one and go straight to fricative. And fricative is if you think of friction, you know, like when it gets warm. If you think of f and v. You can feel, you make a tiny little gap. It's like if you play the clarinet or the oboe or whatever, you have the reed uh, and you blow, uh, you blow air into it. What is it called? Air. Uh, you blow air into it and it vibrates. Okay? That's, what a fr that's basically what a fricative is. It means you're creating friction at some part of the articulatory system. So we have f, v, f, v, s, s, s. You can feel it. And, and it's really good to go through these and make the sounds and then think, where, what is actually happening? You know, like, this is a fricative. So, f yeah, it's my teeth. It's my teeth and, like, the bottom bit of my lip. And there's sort of air going under that. And then, sh and zh. And then you have the, ha, 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 ha. Now, the glottal stop's quite dim Sorry, it's not a glottal stop. It's a, the glottal fric fricative. You're creating friction by the glottal, uh, by the epiglottis. But you might think, oh, it's a kind of a stop. And there's a bit of confusion. I mean, not confusion, there's... This is a lot more complicated than... It's all a lot more complicated than it is in this table. As I say, there's people who like, spend their entire lives, and I don't really understand it. I understand this table, I don't understand everyone else. Um, but just accept that it's a fricative, even if you think, but it's a stop. Uh, it's not, and I'll, I'll show you what the glottal stop is in a second. Oh, in fact, I'll show you what the glottal stop is now. Okay. You know the, the wet stuff that you use to create uh, tea and coffee and you drink it? Okay. In received pronunciation, it's called water. Okay. Were I to come from London, like the east of end of London, I'd say water. And that uh, water, water, water. And that uh sound is called a glottal stop. <coughs> so it would go here. And it's a question mark. It's a, that's a symbol for it. But it's, it's not very, it's quite hard. I know, they, they do it all the time. Well, uh, all right. um, but they don't pronounce T. They, they say, well, uh. 
Okay, so that's with the difference between the glottal stop and the glottal fricative. Then you have approximants, which are basically somewhere between a vowel, where there is no uh, interference whatsoever, and a fricative, where there's lots of interference. So when you form these, yeah, yeah, it's almost a fricative, because the tongue is really close to the roof of the mouth, to the, uh, to the palate, okay? But it's not. You're keeping it away a little bit, okay? So, yeah, yeah. So the palatal approximant is ya, yeah, because it's the roof of the mouth that's sort of creating the about to create the friction, but it's not quite it's not quite a fricative. And an affricate is when you combine a stop with a fricative. And this is why you have the difference between sh and ch and zh and j. Because you're having this ch sound at the beginning and then you glide it in to the sh so ch ch and j and j j okay okay that is the consonant chart and again you can go onto wikipedia and you can find uh, you, you can find uh, articles where you can have people pronounce these if you want to if you want to see it and i'll give you the link to it to the end but this is and you can now go away and look at your own languages uh, consonant table and then see okay what sort of velar fricatives do i have in my in my language uh, are they the same and how do they differ and then you can start bringing them together so we've now gone through vowels, we've gone through consonants. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is stress. And I don't mean the kind of stress from losing power from a room three minutes before you're about to go on stage. I mean how we, what emphasis we give to words. Because this is incredibly important when creating uh, an easy, a nice presentation. And the reason is because we have different meanings. Stress can give different meanings. If you think of record and record, they are two very different things. One is the noun and one is the verb. And if you get them mixed up, then you require your audience to think, do they mean record or are they just, have they just pronounced it incorrectly? And every time you do that, you're, getting your audience, you're giving your audience a reason to listen a little bit less. So, very important and as well uh, I love ice cream and I love ice cream <laughs> <laughs> one sounds like I like ice cream the other sounds like I have a very severe relationship problem uh, does everyone get the difference between the I love okay great so and the second thing is also because it's very important to make a nice easy to listen to presentation think of he walked along the seafront and he looked up at the stars it has a nice flow to it, and you'd be like, oh, okay, great, I hope you are anyway. But he walked along the seafront, and he looked up at the stars. The stress is, it's harder to listen to, and so you want to get the flow as good as possible. And the only way to do this, really, is to listen to people who speak English as a native language in the dialect you've chosen. So if you're interested in received pronunciation, I would recommend an actor called Stephen Fry. He's a very famous actor. I will write it. He's on a slide at the end. And he narrated all the Harry Potter books. So if you're... So, well, and one of the good things is you've got a good sort of corpus of, of work you can go through and read along and listen to him. And don't listen to the words, how he's pronouncing the words. Listen to how he's saying entire sentences. And which words is he stressing and which words is he not stressing. And what you will notice is that he is not stressing an awful lot. And the key, the, the key to getting a good flow to your presentation is this that I mentioned earlier. It's the schwa, the most common sound in the English language for a very good reason. And the reason it's so incredibly important is because when otherwise it sounds like you're just screaming out what you're saying all the time. So if we take our, if we take our friend record, 
the noun is record, okay? So we stress the first. Sorry, the noun is record. <laughs> Sorry. But edit that out. The noun is record, and you mark stress by a little dash at the beginning. And the verb, you move the stress marker here, so you uh, stress cord. But you don't simply do that. You also change the vowel sound at the beginning, from re to r. Okay, record, record. You don't say record because it sounds like you're shouting. Okay, record. I need to record. I need to record. And I used even a schwa in that sentence. I need to record. I didn't say I need to record. I said I need to record. If one can say it like this, not if one can say it like this, but if one can say it like this. And a lot of native English speakers, when they start learning how to teach English, they say, oh, I never use schwas. I never, I never use schwas. I, because they think it's lazy. They think that de-stressing syllables is some sort of, it's a bad thing to do. It's as though you're, you just don't care. You'd be like, yeah. It's not. It is absolutely vital to getting a good flow to what you want to say. So listen to Stephen Fry or whoever it is, some American, whatever they say, uh, and th really think, how is he saying this entire sentence from start to finish? And maybe just listen to the same sentence over and over again, just to think, okay, he's saying, he's saying a schwa here, he's saying eh here, he's saying oh here, he's saying uh here. And it will make your presentations take them to the next level. Yes? Clarify. Yes. Am I understanding you correct if you mean you, to be a good storyteller, you stress a few times, perhaps only in one word? Is this what you, you, stress, you, you need to stress in the right places. So uh, we speak usually with a, some sort of meter. So we have words naturally have a, uh, what's called a foot, which is where you, where you place the stress. If anyone listen to Shakespeare, uh, I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head, but um, uh, I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. You have to, you have to uh, say it in a particular way, because the words have a natural stress to them. But you can't take each word individually and say, okay, this word is stressed here, and this word is stressed here, and this word is stressed here. You have to think of the entire sentence of where should I have the stress. And you can't really be like, oh, there's an Excel formula of you just put a, you know, a sentence in and you get it out. You need to listen to it and really sort of analyse where, where, where am I trying to stress here? Where do, other, where do native speakers place the stress? Which is why I recommend listening to people who you like listening to, because different dialects and different languages stress in different ways. Um, from what I know, Spanish is quite like this. There's quite different stresses to like Mexican Spanish and Spanish Spanish are very different in how they, how they stress the words. So it's quite, it's quite common in languages, but you need to think in terms of sentences. Uh, and just, you can usually hear it as well. Does this sound like a, um, like, a, like a natural sentence? And maybe when you do your next speech at Toastmasters, get to ask someone who's a native speaker and just say, all I want you to look at is what's the stress like of my... Uh, what, what, what is the, what's the flow like of my speech? Not how because you can you can still pronounce words incorrectly in a way. You know you could say or instead of or, uh, and get the stress right. So it's good to focus on them separately. But it's good you need to as I say you need to think of it like music. Of you know you can't just be like da, 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 wherever you like in a piece of music. You have to be so you know sort of piano and forte in different in different bits. Okay. Like limited resources, do you think that it makes more impact to have a correct intonation across the sentence, or like uh, bad pronunciation? I mean, like, do you <laughs> when it sounds worse. I think it depends. I think there's sort of a limit where really good flow is not going to compensate for uh, really bad pronunciation. 
But I think you can get away with a l bad pronunciation if you have a really good flow. Usually they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, and usually you'll find people's pronunciation is actually gets better before their flow, I would say, because you need to have a good pronunciation to have it's almost a prerequisite for a good for a good flow. But you can still make some mistakes. You don't have to be perfect at pronunciation before you can start working on your flow. So um, I think because we're going to after the break, we're going to do some table topics. So we can maybe look at this sort of thing then. Yeah. Uh, because I think probably we should have a bit of a break so we can. Um, but actually, I do have questions. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Uh, yeah, just like I, one of my pet peeves is I can't differentiate to pronounce Thai as in the Thai country and Thai chicken style. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't know whether that's a phoneme thing or is it a pressure thing. I still can't. I didn't know that. What Thai? I pronounce everything Thai. Both. Thai. Yeah. Thai. Thai. Yeah. There's no difference. Or from the country. Thai chicken. Thai Thailand. Yeah. Oh, Thai! Okay, I, was like, I think they like Thai curry. I was like, <laughs> chicken curry is like it's the same thing. Uh, thai. Okay, we can go back to. Uh, that is here. Thai. Thai. Which one? The leg. Uh, yeah, the leg. Thigh. The tongue is on the teeth. Thigh. 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 You know what I was saying about how you, you, you learn this by learning that you do ballet or whatever, or football or the, the oboe? Just practice. If you have a problem with the sound, practice that sound for a week until you can do it. Yeah. How do you, like an album, you do writing because you could, if you're doing it on your own, yeah. <coughs> you have to, get, you, I would, you have to ask for feedback, de definitely. And that's why this, uh, but you can also get it from this uh, chart, this interactive chart. So you can click on it and it will say, th, th, thigh, or th, think, th, three. So you can, uh, you can get feedback either from listening to native speakers uh, or you can ask people, yeah, ask people. Um, you can also, there are really good videos on YouTube that show uh, phonemes and they have animations of where the tongue is and what the vocal cords are doing and again it can be difficult to be like, okay, what, you know, how shall I really, you know, like move my tongue on my vocal cords, but at least you get an idea of if you're doing something wrong, I think. Uh, they're, they're, they're quite good. But yeah, asking for feedback is a really good idea. And again, be specific with an evaluator. Pick someone who is a native speaker of English and ask them to be like, okay, how are my, what are my th sounds like? That's, that's what I want you to look at. And write a speech with lots of, th not ridiculous, <laughs> <laughs> three Thai thighs. <laughs> uh, but. Um, but yeah, you need to get feedback. But as I say, don't try and like learn all of them at once. Learn a couple of sounds, get some feedback, and then when you feel like you're, when you feel like you've made some real progress, then maybe have a break and try some other sounds, and then you can always come back to them if you want to become completely perfect. But you'll then raise up your your entire language sort of level, quite uh, fairly quickly, and you'll go to, you know, you'll go from level nine to level ten. You might not have de defeated the big boss yet, but. You, it's, it's really incredible how the difference it makes uh, when you just practice little bits of, uh, of a language with pronunciation. Um, so after the break, I, we're going to do table topics. I'm going to, everyone, is going to get, everyone who wants to come up is going to get the same topic. But there's a twist. But the twist you'll find out afterwards. But the topic is, what, or the question is, what is your favourite book and why? Or alternatively, something about what, uh, what book did you, what's the last really good book you read? Something about a book and why you like it. Okay? So have a think about that if you want to do table topics. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll present what the twist to table topics is. Okay? Thank you. Is everyone ready? Yeah.
Okay, so now it is going to be table topics with a twist. I told you the topic beforehand. The twist is anybody who comes up and does a table topic actually has to do two. Oh. So what you're going to do is you're going to come up, speak for a minute, minute and a half, whatever, about your favourite book and why you like it. I am going to write down three words that you need to think about because you're not pronouncing them maybe entirely correctly. Mm -hmm. You're then going to sit down and the next person is going to come up and do about that favourite book. Then the first person is going to come back and talk about their favourite film and why they like it. And they have to make sure they use these three words that I wrote down mm -hmm. in that, present, that second presentation and use them correctly. Okay, does everyone get the idea? So you do it once, you get some feedback, you go and sit down, you think about your feedback, and then you get to come up again and have another go using the same, same words. Anyone unclear on that? Okay, so I need a timekeeper. Can someone act as timekeeper? And we can swap around timekeeper, so if someone wants to. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, yeah, before we start here, I say well, I'll, I'll load this up to a Dropbox or something. It'll be posted on Facebook or email. Uh, this is where you can do an interactive phony chart, and that is the guy who is who's got very nice uh, RP English and narrated Harry Potter, amongst other things. Who wants to go first? Yeah, one minute, First, um, one thirty. But we don't have half a half a minute before. No, everyone's yeah. has their time to think yes. about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one minute. Yeah. Uh, I pick up uh, British, British flow. <laughs> I'll try to simulate that one. So uh, first of all, first of all, uh, it was. Uh, hard uh, it was a bit difficult to remember the last book uh, I read completely. That's my problem. I don't finish um, many books, but um, <laughs> it's a Russian. It's a Russian book by a Russian author named uh, Vladimir Sorokin, um, and it's one of his uh, last books, titled Teluria, and it's about actually a, fu a future Europe as he uh, saw it. Uh, I like this book because um, it's a it's a fiction book. It's about like let's say Europe 2040 or something, and he uh, monitored, he scanned all their fears that we have in Europe in different countries about the immigrants uh, coming to Europe um, and uh, some inner political problems and so on. He exaggerated them and created a, a collection of stories uh, and um, with exaggerated art uh, forms um, and uh, yeah <laughs> so that's the book um, <coughs> I read last and uh, I liked it <laughs> Okay, so you now have the next person's table topics to come up. So look at hard, okay, you said hard, so hard, future, 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 and monitor, so mon you said monitor, monitor, okay, do you want to write this down or you go? Hard future monitor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 the name of the band. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, who's next? Uh, okay. Um, I will try uh, some kind of American style. Okay. Uh, so the book I am almost finished with is a book by an author called J.D. Vance. It's called Hillbilly Elegy. And elegy is a difficult word, but I think it means something like uh, sad poem or something like that. 
and uh, it's uh, it's on the New York Times uh, top list. Um, so, and it's a great book because it's about this this uh, redneck from the hillbilly country of uh, Kentucky, and um, he uh, is surrounded by white trash, and he describes that part of America, which is quite poor. He makes a lot of links to why a certain president has been elected as well, and describes a bit why why the sentiment in America is, is like that. And he himself has made a social journey, one of almost, <coughs> he's almost the only one in his neighborhood and his community who did that. He finally became a um, Yale Law School student and became a, um, uh, made that profession very successfully. All his other friends didn't do any of that. They stayed in Kentucky or Ohio. And uh, it's a very interesting story of how he made that change. And he can reflect on the fact that there's a large population of, of America with a very different view than maybe other ones if you go to the East Coast. The East Coast. And that's why I like his story. Thank you. Okay. okay, because it's American, I have difficulties working out what's wrong. Uh, so, but one, uh, one thing was uh, hillbilly. You uh, try and stress uh -huh. the last word, even in American, is it yeah. hill, um, hillbilly? I should stress the first. Uh, hillbilly. 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 That's correct. Yeah. That sounds correct. Okay. And uh, sentiment. So try and soften the last sentiment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now we have coming back. Uh, okay. Let's go for another one. Who would like to? Who is first? Uh, Andon. Cool. Dad, I don't want to go to school anymore. School is for birds. What do you mean don't go to school? You have to go to school. School is super important. But Dad, you're not listening. What do you mean don't listening? We're talking right now. No, Dad, I'm saying that you're never listening to what I'm saying. This is a classic example. When you have a teenage boy or girl, right? And I don't have these yet, but I, someday I will. So what I did, I read a book to understand how interaction between people can be in a meaningful way. And when I read this book, I thought, oh my god, this is the best book I've ever written, read, reading, read. <laughs> but when I actually read another book, I realized the first one I read about this subject wasn't the best one. The second one I'm going to give to you, that was the best one. Mm -hmm. And th this is why. Because this w book talks about five different ways to meaningful communication. And the first one we saw here was the father is he's hearing something that the daughter or the boy doesn't want to go to school. So if he were to understand what's happening here, he could have said, like, I can hear that you are frustrated, frustrated about going to school. So the dad is formulating the words in a new kind of way, which shows the daughter that he is actually listening, paying attention. And when the dad instead says, but school is really important, you have to go to school, he's not recognizing the feelings of the girl, right? And he doesn't show that he's understanding, so the meaningful communication is missed. And what this book is actually teaching us, five different techniques on how to understand what's going on in your relationships. It's an amazing book. It's called Feeling Good Together. It's actually a couple theater book, but yes, <laughs> Feeling Good Together, Dr. David Burns. Thank you. Okay, you have a tendency to drop your D's, so, when, so you say understand instead of understand. You want me to say understand. Understand. Yep. Understand. And you have, you have a tendency to say z instead of so z instead of the. Yeah. The girl is. The girl is. The girl is. No, the girl. What's this better? 
And your chapter ten six is at the end. Uh, sorry, you, you, you say uh, us instead of us. So there you've kind of put a, uh, an S to actually be a Z. Is it a word? Us? Us. Us? Us. It's not us. We should. Understand the us. Yes. Understand the us. Understand the us. We've got iTunes catalog here. Okay, is someone who's beamed, are they ready to come back? Are you ready to come back? Are you ready? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you're ready, go ahead. Now we're ready. I'd like to talk about uh, the TV series that I watched recently, and it is uh, called uh, Cat Catastrophe. Um, it's actually about an American guy uh, and an Irish girl. They met in London. Uh, they had amazing sex uh, for, <laughs> for a week. Then the American guy left, never to be seen again, I guess, uh, for Boston. Then it was a... Uh, yeah, there was no communication on the monitors. <laughs> <laughs> monitors. Uh, and uh, then uh, all of a sudden, um, the lady calls, calls uh, the guy while he's having a date with some, some other lady. Uh, and then they have a hard talk. And basically, uh, the lady explains that she's pregnant. Uh, and you got to come back to London so that we, uh, in the future, uh, we move in <coughs> and so on. Uh, that's not exactly uh, uh, what the, the dialogue was about, but uh, anyway. And then the story continues and they get kids and so on, and they uh, live very interesting life in London. Thank you very much. It's called Catastrophe because of this uh, news um, that... Okay, I'm, pre I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Martha, do you want to do one? You had your hand up a second ago. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, but then Martha wants to say. <laughs> so, let me talk about the book. The book first. It's favorite book, right? Favorite book. <coughs> so I don't read fiction very much. I wish I do. But one of the fiction I read five years ago, or even more, was uh, set in this context in uh, old time Afghanistan before the Taliban actually come in. Now, it's a fiction, so none, none of this is actually a real story. However, it's so close to um, history that you can imagine it. The reason why it, 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 I felt so strongly about this book is because I grew up in Jakarta, and Jakarta is the most you know, Muslim populated country. It's a secular nation, but it has the most number of Muslims. And the book talks a lot about the liberation that the girls found by being under a niqab, and it twisted so much of, of my per perspective. Of course, it's controversial about niqab and what it means to a general population, but I, what I really like is this one perspective. And interestingly enough, the author was actually a guy. So it was amazing um, that he has managed to get this, this perspective that I could, I could relate to. Uh, the fact that when someone is put under any cup, you are actually free to feel and, and express how you feel in underneath that <coughs> veil. And that was something that I thought was mind blowing to me because it was completely different. The book is called A Thousand Splendid Sun by Khaled Hosini. You probably, some of you probably read it, and that's why it's my favorite fiction book. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so two th though I heard two things. That uh, story, you story. Has a story, story. What did I say? You said something like story. Story. <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah, there's something story or. Story. 
story. So yeah. I know you want to sound like Hugh Jackman. We had a discussion about Hugh Jackman, <laughs> uh, but I can't do that. Uh, and uh, you say means instead of means. <coughs> Even though the word spelt with an S, it's the sound of a Z. Right. Means. 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 What does like right? us? <laughs> <laughs> so I said means. It's it means. should be means. Means. It should be with a Z. It should be with a Z. Yes, you oh. say it with an S. Okay, means. Means. Okay. Means. Right, story. Means. 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 Yeah. And that's it. That's okay, awesome. Okay. Thank you. Okay, who's who's been and wants to come back? Let's see. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me take some more. That's the film. I'm not sure I can copy the same word, but we'll try. So the movie, uh, it's an old movie, I know many of you have probably seen it. Um, I think it's very good. It's a Jack Nicholson movie called As Good As It Gets. Uh, it's about him being a writer, very prejudiced writer. He sits on his own and he hates the world. He hates everybody. Uh, he hates women, he hates um, his uh, homosexual neighbor, he hates animals. And any disturbance, he gets, he goes crazy. Um, and he throws the, the neighbor's cat to the trash can. You know, he does all kinds of things. Um, he's, he's, one, he's just once interviewed um, by a reporter, because he's quite a famous author. And the reporter asks him, how can you do women so well in your books? And he says, well, I think of a man, and I take out reason and accountability. <laughs> So he thinks, says things like this, but the thing is, in the movie, he changes. He, he falls in love with, with uh, this woman, I think this is Judy Foster. Uh, he starts making friends with his gay neighbor. He understands that there's more to life than just being an ignorant guy in his uh, apartment. And uh, he's still a bit of an asshole in the end of the movie, but it's, it's fun to see how he changes over the course of the movie. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have one more spot? Yes, we can have one more spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I don't read that much fiction either, but I do read a fair amount of um, uh, science books or popular science books. Um, <laughs> not all of them are uh, books that I can recommend to people because they might be either uh, controversial or uh, probably not maybe too, too specific, but I'm wondering well, one book that I do recommend uh, when I have people looking at my bookshelf is uh, Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything, which is a really nice book. It's, it uh, goes through uh, like the human history or I think that maybe the history of the universe in a very uh, in a very nice way. Um, where he talks about different phases of the, the evolution and different phases of the universe and uh, even the small details of, of re recent history uh, of, of the human race. And uh, one, one part that I, uh, that I remember that I think is quite nice and quite, quite fitting here as well is he talks about the expression uh, she sells seashells by the seashore or something like that. And that is actually uh, grounded in, in a piece of history where there was a woman named Mary or Sue or something like that who actually did collect a bunch of seashells <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sold them or did something with them. Uh, so that's, that's a book I like. Mm -hmm. I actually only found one that was noticeable and that was, okay. you evidently said, you said human instead of human. 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 Yeah, so it's like the glottal shoe. Human. That is Australian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, human. <laughs> human whistle. <laughs> um, so stick that. Uh, stick that uh, okay. Human. Okay. Because we're sort of running a, a bit out of time. So maybe if we do, we can do a couple more, and but we don't come back. Um, it's probably uh, it's the best. Is there someone who wants to have a go? Okay, Raj, and then uh, did I want to?
I'm going to talk about the book named Tirukkural, which means uh, esteemed songs, which was written. Uh, it was written about 2080 years before, and it was about the how human can proceed his life. The book has a uh, three chapters. One is talk uh, first chapter talks about moral livelihood and second is like a wealth and third is about sex and so in three chapter total 1330 songs are there and these songs are in each song has a eight words and it's similar to haiku poem and yeah and I always wonder how in the 2000 years they write the best book uh, without there is no religion and it's quite completely secular and yeah so I often read these books to have some guidance in my life. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, three words to look at. Uh, first, you pronounce first. Sorry. First. 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 Yeah. Uh, these, uh, you need to pronounce it more the, these. The ease. These. 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 Religion. 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 Yeah. Religion. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Ramon. This morning, before I came here, I read one of the short stories of one of my favorite books of fiction, which is called El Aleph. Um, this is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's also related to a number that represents infinity. So most of the stories are about mysticism, connections in history, and the possibility that everything exists in our thoughts. The most famous story of the book is called El Aleph as well, and it's about a writer that has a special object in his cellar where he can see everything that is happening in the universe at the same time. So the core of the story is trying to give a description of how feeling and being in the presence of the infinite felt like. Another story is about a Aztec priest who at the end of the Aztec empire puts upon his shoulders the task of deciphering the language in which the gods wrote the secrets of the universe. So he's in prison on a dark cell and he only sees a jaguar for a couple of minutes of the day, every day for 15 years. He learns the spots of the shower by of the of the jaguar by heart and then he deciphers what the gods intended for him to decipher. So the core of that story is as well the message that is reading for him over there. Other stories like that talk about the connections between a barbarian in the fall of the Roman Empire who changed sides on the middle of the battle and fought for Rome against the invasion of the Huns. And a British lady who was trapped in the Argentinian conquest of the Native American people and he decided to switch sides. So the parallels between these two characters is someone that he elaborates in this book about. So I read El Aleph this morning again, just for pleasure, and this book talks about these kind of topics that I really, really like. So that's the book of my Okay, stories. Uh, it's stories. Stories. Even, even if you're saying it in American English, it's stories. <laughs> so it's an or, or, or. Uh, it, you, you're saying it's short, so you're saying stories. Yeah. The length of that, uh, either American or Korean. Then instead of it's about, you have a tendency to say is about. 
Okay, uh, so, so it's, um, and uh, use a shower as well. Perhaps the sh sound a little bit. How do you say shower? I tried to mean the animal, by the way. Jower. How do you say oh. it? <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a mistake with the last one. I see how. Uh, okay. <laughs> or Jaguar. Jaguar. Jaguar in America. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Oh, okay. Cool, repeat to me this again. Uh, stories. Stories. It is. It's. It's. Or, yeah, or it is. Okay. Um, and Jaguar. Jaguar. <laughs> 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 Okay, it's 12 o'clock. Shall we maybe go to the Notre Sites or mm -hmm. go do something? Get out in the sunshine. Yeah. Do you have an advice on sort of how to unlearn what what I then already learned in my English? Like I would probably also have said stories. So how do I sort of just practice the new sound? It's it's yeah. exactly the same way as as I said, learning the um. What do you think? So with the instruments, you know, like you've, you've learned it one way and you've learned a different one and you just practice and you want. It's just muscle memory. So eventually you'll just, you'll do it without even thinking. But just practice the new way. And don't worry too much about incorporating it into your uh, everyday language until you're really happy with it. Uh, and then maybe stop doing it. Just get used to okay, mouth, teeth, lips. Okay, you guys have anything? No? Mm. Then let's go out and enjoy the sunshine. Great.